Tonight, we have a speaker from the Coastal Prairie Conservancy, originally the Katy Prairie. If you haven't been out there, it's just, I've been out there a few years, but it was exciting to be there. And I was there just as spring was coming out. The prairie was unbelievably beautiful. She uh, is a master gardener, and she sits on the board of the Coastal Prairie Conservancy. That's why they nominated her to come and speak to us. And she also has completed the training for NSOC on Level 1 and Level 3, which is really nice. And so I want to introduce Iris and take it away, Iris. I appreciate the introduction, Helen. I am with the Katy Prairie Conservancy. I'm a volunteer and serve on the board. And I want to give you a brief introduction to the Conservancy and its work. I have a little two minute video clip that was actually made when we were still the Katy Prairie Conservancy, but I really think you'll like it. So I'm gonna go ahead and play that. A monarch butterfly probably isn't thinking about how a restored prairie acts like a sponge when it rains, capturing rainfall and slowing water movement. Most likely, this herd of cattle doesn't wonder about sustainable grazing and how it increases soil health and improves regional resiliency. Flying overhead, the sandhill crane is not contemplating how more than half of all North American birds nest rest, breed, or feed in wetlands. And these students aren't dreaming about how protecting the prairie and keeping lands in agriculture ensures regional food production, recreational opportunities, and a vital local economy. What she is thinking about is that these prairie nectar plants provide important food before her long trip down to Mexico. With the sun overhead and food underfoot, these wide open spaces are made to roam. Spots with no light and shallow water let him tuck his head under his shoulder and roost for the night. And the freedom beneath these big skies and amid this vast landscape allows them to run far and dream big. So whether you're just stopping by, you call the prairie your home, or you're looking for your next adventure. We are saving all of this for you. The Katy Prairie Conservancy. Saving coastal prairie for wildlife and people. I have to admit that I get a little choked up when I see that. So we are the Coastal Prairie Conservancy, formerly the Katy Prairie Conservancy, founded in 1992. We are supported by the community and we're an accredited nonprofit land trust. We go through an accreditation process every two years. We're pretty proud of that. It's uh, some fairly strict criteria we have to meet. And so far, we have protected over 30,000 acres in Southeast Texas. So the coastal prairie once extended from here around Kingsville all the way up the coast and into Louisiana where it was called the Cajun Prairie. It once covered like 3.8 million hectares and today more than 99% of that land has been lost. The remainder is highly fragmented and severely threatened by invasions of toxic species and urban sprawl. So in Louisiana, there are only of the 1 million hectares that was the coastal prairie, only about 100 remain. And I think the article that you may have seen in Sunday's Chronicle, which was on the front page, said that in Texas, only about uh, 65,000 acres remain. We were the Katy Prairie Conservancy, and our footprint was here in Harris and Waller counties. You could see where the county line is, and we crossed over into those two counties. But in uh, around 2018, we saw that there were opportunities to save some valuable coastal prairie land 
elsewhere in this system. So we expanded to a nine county region that includes Harris, Waller, Austin, Colorado, Jackson, Matagorda, Brazoria, Fort Bend, and Wharton counties. For purposes of this talk, I'm going to zoom in on the Katy Prairie Preserve, which is located at the headwaters of Cypress Creek. And you see it here as we zoom in a little closer. And then I'm going to go in a little closer still. And over here in Waller County, this is the county line here and the Indian Grass Preserve, which is where our field office is located, is where I spend most of my time. So I'm going to be talking mostly about that. And here's the Ann Hamilton Trail. And I'm going to talk about that a little more. So here's the entrance road and the field office. And this area is what is now the Ann Hamilton Trail. This is what it looked like, sort of a time lapse. The property was owned by a division of Dow Chemical that did agricultural experimentation. So you can see that there's this grid of different vegetation. At the north end here was pecan trees, which are still there. And there were peach, there was a peach grove of peach trees here. And I don't know what all the rest of this was, but you can see it was all gridded off and there was infrastructure for uh, irrigation and so forth. Well, in 2014, we began the restoration process and we were able to get aerial photographs from back in the 30s before it was plowed, before it became agricultural land. And we were able to see based on the vegetation in those photographs, we were able to see where the lower wet areas were and where the higher, uh, more drier grasslands were. And we recreated that topography so that now you see this trail system with wetlands and then the higher grasslands. And if you were to visit us today, well, you probably wouldn't see it from this angle, but this is uh, what it looks like. Back here is our native plant nursery where I spend most of my time. This is our field office. And then here's the trail system. And we're opened on Tuesdays and Fridays from nine till one and on Saturdays from nine to one for anyone that wants to come out and visit and hike the trail. If you were at ground level, you might see this if you came to visit us in the fall when the goldenrod is blooming. This uh, Indian grass preserve, it's not a remnant prairie. It's not a prairie that existed before. The land was there, but it was converted to agriculture. So to achieve this, this is a prairie restoration. Some of the plants that you'll see that we're gonna talk about are naturally occurring but very many of the plants are the result of our restoration efforts. And that has resulted so far in this rich mosaic of wetland and grassland with hundreds of Texas native species of grasses and forbs. The best time of year to see and identify these species is fall and early winter. Although the springtime is great for the wildflowers too. So like Helen said, I'm a volunteer. Since 1999, I've been volunteering with the Conservancy. I'm a member of the Houston chapter of NIPSOT, and I've been a Texas Master Naturalist since 2018. I started working in the native plant nursery there at Indian Grass in 2017. And in October of 2019, I did level one of the native landscape certification program there at Clear Lake. And I wanna give a shout out to some of the people who were teachers that day, Patty Pennington, Nancy Saint, Scott Buchel, Cindy Howard, Martha Richardson, and Royce Pendergast. Thank you. You got me off to a great start. So I'm still an amateur. I'm far from being an expert. I love the prairie but I spend most of my time doing 
and not studying. So if you see anything I've misstated or any plant that I've misidentified, feel free to provide corrections. I will not be bothered or embarrassed. Just go ahead and put your note in chat. So it'll be right for other people that see this later. So you probably remember the nursery rhyme, Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? Well, because we want to talk about prairie plants, I changed that up a little bit. Charlie, Charlie, never tardy, how does your prairie grow? With toil and sun, soil and rain, I have grasses and wildflowers, both high and low. And here's Charlie. Charlie's one of our volunteers. Here he is with his jeweler's loop. And here are some of the photographs that Charlie's taken of the wildflowers in the spring. So what is a prairie? A prairie could be defined as a diverse plant community dominated by grasses. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Chris Helzer, the prairie ecologist, uh, but he did a project a few years ago uh, that he calls the One Square Meter Project. And he's an excellent photographer. A one square meter, if you think about it, it's smaller than most of today's TV screens. And Chris says that by the end of his year long project, he had photographed 113 different species of plants and animals within that one square meter. That included 15 plant species, 22 different flies, 18 beetles, and 14 species of bees. He had glimpses of some mammals, but wasn't able to get photographs. They wouldn't stay still for him. I've created a resource page which will be made available to you. It's a PDF and it has links. And one of the links is to Chris Helzer's One Square Meter Project, if you want to take a look at that. It's just fascinating. So we could spend an entire program talking about tall grasses or just talking about sunflowers or non-native invasives. But this program I call a prairie sampler. I want you to walk away with the idea that prairie plants grow in a community with each other and they live with the insects and other animals like us that depend upon them. We'll talk briefly about native prairie plants and some of their ugly step cousins, the non-natives that are invasive. So in the foreground here in this picture, we have Indian grass. That's the one with the plume on it with a grasshopper. And in the mid ground, this kind of all fuzzy looking stuff is dog fennel. And a little further back is goldenrod. Right up close in the front, this brown glob is the seed pods from Illinois bundleflower. A natural prairie abounds with long lived perennials that form a sod or a mat of intertwined roots as this picture illustrates. So disturbances to this mass are rapidly filled in by growth from surrounding plants. With a few exceptions, annuals are rare in this undisturbed soil. And you can see how deep some of these roots go the picture on the left shows you the switchgrass plant from the tip of the leaves down to the bottom of the roots. It's as much as 14 feet. This study illustrated how these prairie plants are, with their deep roots, are so good at handling a lot of rain, a lot of flood water. So an undisturbed prairie with its deep mat of perennials could absorb up to eight inches of water. Open space, which would be like say grazing land that has some plants other than just Bermuda grass, but it could absorb up to two inches per hour. But our developed property with all of our hardscape and all of our shallow rooted turf grasses would only absorb five inches per hour. And those of us who have experienced sort of traumatic flooding in our homes 
know how important it is to be surrounded by these prairies and we really cringe at the idea of the developed property getting closer and closer to us so we're going to jump right into grasses here the prairie plant community is dominated by grasses so that's where we're going to begin and there are four grass species that are characteristic of all tall grass prairies there, those four plus one more are indicative of coastal prairie ecosystems. And you know they are all bunch grasses, not turf grasses. Bunch grasses with their deep roots and not turf grasses with their very shallow roots. So first one, I'm gonna go through these pretty quick. A lot of you are probably already familiar with them. Big blue stem. It's a perennial, it's called turkey foot. You'll see that in a minute. Blooms in the fall, it's called ice cream for cows, but it doesn't tolerate overgrazing. It evolved to cope with the seasonal migration of bison. So, you know, they would come and eat it, but then they would move on. So you can't just leave cattle on it for a long period of time, it'll destroy the plants. Big blue stem is a climax species, which means that it will, when the pace of succession slows down, then the climax species are the result of ecological homostasis. So they're more sophisticated than the opportunistic species like your, a lot of your annuals. So big blue stem, turkey foot, here's your Here's why it's called turkey foot, because of the formation of the seed head. And it has this beautiful reddish color in the late fall and winter. Next, we have little blue stem, which again is a warm season perennial. It's the larval host for several species of skipper butterflies. And in the winter, it provides a lot of seed for sparrows. We get a lot of sparrows on the prairie in the winter time. It is the shortest of the tall grass prairie species, blooms from June through December. And I love being able to identify it because of the red and green alternating color up the stem. And here's a couple of more pictures of little blue stem and the seeds. Okay, next switchgrass is another perennial. It has these loose, lacy seed heads. And I love the color in the winter time. When I drive into the Indian Grass Preserve in the winter, it just stands out, just shines like gold in the sun. Indian grass has this beautiful plume on it. It's a soft golden brown seed head pretty easy to identify when it's in bloom like this. And then we've got Eastern Gamma grass. That's the fifth species that's on the coastal prairie, but not in the other areas of the tall grass prairie, which go all the way up through the Great Plains and up into Canada. With the Eastern Gamma grass, it spreads by rhizomes. It can become very aggressive. You don't want to do this one at home. Probably will not put this in your garden. We're right now trying to do some improvements at our Shrike Prairie, which leads to the Matt Cook Wildlife Viewing Platform. We had planted some Eastern Gamma there and it really got out of hand. So now we're having to remove some of it and replace it with some other species so we can get more diversity there. On the other hand, the deer love it. It's related to corn. The deer eat it and then the animals make their beds in it. I've seen it just flattened out from the center where they've uh, curled up and bedded down. Now we come to a non-native invasive grass that we should all be familiar with. This one, like our others, is a warm season perennial. It gets to be about two meters tall. And the way you identify the basy grass, one easy way is to look, not every leaf will have this serrated edge, but some of them will on the more mature plants. So that's an easy way to identify it. 
And another way is to look down at the base and at the base, it'll be red, but it will also have stiff hairs that can give you quite a sting if you touch them. Okay, next we have something related that's similar to grass in the, you know, it's green all the time. This one is a sedge, deep rooted sedge. It really loves wet conditions and it rapidly spreads from disturbed to natural areas. So wherever there was rice being farmed, if they quit farming it, then it will just turn into a monoculture of deep rooted sedge and that displaces the native vegetation. Once established, it outcompetes the native grasses and threatens local plant biodiversity. So one of these plants, as you can see the seed head here, it can produce a million seeds and those seeds are easily spread. So one thing that we do out at Indian Grass where we have quite a bit of this is to cut off the seed heads and bag them up to get rid of them so that um, they're not just creating more and more. And then also we dig it up. Now, we'd much rather see some of these native sedges. This one, which looks very much like deep-rooted sedge is quite different though, because deep-rooted sedge, you've always heard that sedges have edges. Well, with deep rooted sedge, the edges are very smooth. So you can still feel that it's a triangle, but it's a very smooth edged. Whereas this flat sedge, the triangular stem is very well defined, very sharp edges. Then there's this white top sedge. It's really beautiful when there's a lot of it. I've seen this on our Schliff Road Prairie. This photograph I picked up from Green Star Nursery, so I want to give a shout out to them. They are local, and if you are looking for any kind of plants for wetlands or rain garden, check out Green Star Nursery. Then the one on the right is Cherokee Sedge. I planted some of this in my yard where the gutters drain down to the ground because it likes to be wet, and it's really a beautiful mound of grass. Well, it's a sedge, but it looks like grass. Now, when I do field trips for master naturalists and others, I like to show them this, what I call a grass bouquet. I collected all of this on one day in November, early November, and I'll just briefly go through it, starting from the left here. So here we have split beard blue stem. It's lovely, and I have some of this growing in my garden. We have Indian grass, we have broom sedge, which is not a sedge, it's actually a grass and it's one of the blue stem grasses. So it's broom sedge, blue stem. Here we have the turkey's foot, big blue stem. Here we have long spike tridents. And if you collect the seed from this, with all of the grasses, you're gonna put your fingers here and pull up to pull the seeds off of the seed head, but with long spike, you're gonna go the opposite direction. It's fun. Then we have switch grass and we have purple top tridents, which is a similar seed head, but see how it droops. The purple top has a droopy seed head. Then Eastern gamma grass, which is this, see it looks like kernels of corn. Bushy blue stem down here on the right, which is an early succession plant and not root bristle grass, which you can hardly see over here. Little blue stem, which is right here in the middle. Gulf muley, which is just a fuzzy apparition here. Purple love grass down here and Florida Pasphalum. I did this after I cut them, I brought them home, spread them out on newspaper and sprayed them with a, an extra hold hairspray. And they have lasted now for about 10 months. So I, I highly recommend doing this little exercise yourself. You will learn so much. Now that we've covered grasses, 
do we have any questions about grasses? We don't have any questions, but somebody did comment. I have found if you grow Eastern gamma grass in shade, it is not aggressive. Interesting. That's good to know. Okay, so we're going to move on to forbs. And a forb is a herbaceous flowering plant other than a grass. That was pretty easy. And we have a lot of different ways of slicing and dicing and classifying forbs. But I'm going to stick with something we're all pretty familiar with, which is annuals, perennials, biennials. So in an annual, the life cycle is one growing season. That may not be a year. Sometimes a growing season can just be you know, shorter than a year. But it's one growing season, and only the dormant seed bridges the gap from one generation to the next. So I was explaining to someone this morning that if you want galardia in your garden, then you can't just pull up the dead plants and throw them away. You've got to put the seed back down on the ground so you get some more. Perennials, on the other hand, persist for many seasons. They may die back in winter and regrow in spring. So there are perennials that are evergreen, although I can't think of very many, and not native. And there are a lot of deciduous perennials. And then a biennial will grow a small rosette in the first year. In the second year, it flowers, seeds, and dies. So this example is Texas prickly poppy, and it is a biennial. No wonder I had so much trouble trying to germinate that <laughs> and grow it. I wanted to talk about disturbance relative to annuals. So disturbance encourages annuals. Disturbance like fire, grazing, mowing, or for us at our Indian Grass Preserve, removing invasives. So these disturbances help to distribute the seed and allow light and heat to reach the seedlings. This annual is sneezeweed and it talk about disturbance. It actually grows in the gravel parking area right around the field office. It's a pretty hardy little plant. A lot of our, what we think of our Texas wildflowers, our iconic Texas wildflowers, are annuals. So Indian blanket is one that I love and use extensively. It's also called firewheel or blanket flower. It's in the aster family. Bees love it. And it's great for pocket prairies and lazy gardeners. Then we have Galardia ambliodon. Don't test me on my Latin because I'm not very good at pronouncing it, but I don't know anybody who really is. We all pronounce things a little differently, but red blanket flower and Aggies like to call this maroon blanket flower. Bees again, love it. And like the other blanket flower, it's great for pocket prairies and lazy gardeners. We have black eyed Susan. This one was growing next to the house near the air conditioning. I think it's one of the first wildflowers I learned as a child. Birds, bees, and butterflies love it. Out at Indian grass, we have a lot of American basket flower. I really didn't know about this plant until I started seeing it there at Indian grass. It can be very tall, but I've noticed with the conditions lately with this drought that I've had some that are just like a foot tall with one bloom. But then I have others that this year, most of them have not gotten as tall as previous years, but they're blooming right now. Still, they were late getting started this year for some reason after the cold weather. But one thing I would encourage you to do is to leave the dead plants, uh, like see this one here on the left that's died out, leave the dead plant upright through the rest of the summer because in late summer, you get these vines. There are a lot of different species of vines that grow on the prairie. And you get these vines that will use the plant like a trellis. 
I have American basket flower here in my garden next to the fence. And you can see the bent basket flower. You can even see some spent blooms here. And this is scarlet creeper that's growing all over it. And here's one out on the prairie growing with the smart weed. Also, when you do cut this down, if you have it in your garden or we do cut it down at Indian Grass Preserve, leave the spent plant on the ground because bees will use it to burrow in and lay their eggs. So then wait until the spring and when all the bees emerge before you toss the dead plant material. Partridge pea in this photograph is an annual, but I have read that even in undisturbed prairie sod, you will find partridge pea. And maybe that's because the animals that eat the beans or the pea pods then leave them on the ground and they're able to make contact with the soil. And that's just my guess. I don't really know why, but it's uh, a curious, I always want to learn more and uh, these things intrigue me. Like other members of the pea family, the partridge pea has to have the microorganisms that inhabits the root system and produce nitrogen compounds for the plant survival. And this is the host plant for the cloudless sulfur butterfly. Next, I wanna talk about bee balm. Lemon bee balm, uh, Monarda citriodora, has this lovely lemony scent. It's also called horse mint. It can be white or pink or purple. This one just happens to be very colorful. And thank you, my friend Isabel, for this photograph. It also attracts bees and butterflies. Lemon bee balm is an annual. Now we have spotted bee balm. It's a perennial. It's in the mint family. And the leaves smell like fine Greek oregano. It attracts bees and butterflies. If you give it water, horse mint may continue to flower through the end of summer. Gulf fur vein, and I mentioned my friend Isabel, she was helping me make a dry creek bed here in my backyard. And I got this, this is the only photograph I could find that would show how the Zutha, the Gulf vervain, which we call Zutha, has this snake-like flower heads. Here they look more upright. It's just beautiful. I love the way it blows in the wind. We want to remove the invasive Brazilian vervain, and we like to replace it with this native. So here's the invasive Brazilian vervain. It's really ugly. It grows up to six feet. It blooms year round. It's always blooming and seeding. It's really terribly invasive. It has a square stem. That's one way that we teach people to identify it. But it's really important to notice how the bloom sits right here on the top of the plant, as opposed to, I'm going to go back to this one, where you can see the blooms are come up along the stem here. Next, somebody mentioned this, said that they were looking to buy one of these in the fall. I have a lot of this in my yard and it occurs naturally at our Indian grass preserve and the vines grow along the ground. But at home, I have them trained up on trellises. At Indian grass, these plants were really noticeable last year. They have a beautiful, they're called Passiflora incarnata, and there's a whole lore about the meaning of all these different plant parts and having to do with the passion of Christ. I'll let you look that up, but here's the fruit, and these fruit are called maypops because when they fall on the ground and they dry out, if you step on them, they make a loud popping sound. This is the host plant for the Gulf Fritillary butterfly. I have some of this growing in front of my house. And this morning I looked and counted 
35 caterpillars on one plant and they are so hungry that they're eating not just the leaves but they are actually eating the fruit off of the vine and here's one that had just hatched or emerged from the chrysalis taken on my front porch this is also host plant for other butterfly species as you see here it can get out of hand. So if you're concerned about it getting loose in your yard, you might want to keep it in a container. Next, we have white gara. Like the Gulf fir vane, the white gara flower stalks blow around in the wind, can be very beautiful. The bloom opens early in the morning, but it's closed by midday. You can cut it back if you're trying to grow this in your garden. You can cut it back in April or May, and it will then do more branching out and have more blooms and not be quite as tall. Otherwise, it can get to be a little overwhelming. It's a great nectar plant for bees and butterflies. And as you can see, my friend Susie Martin had this hummingbird visiting her white gara. Iringo are some of my favorite plants, also called rattlesnake. Well, one of them is called rattlesnake master. That's the yucca folium, leavenworth, and hooker's Iringo. This is rattlesnake master, both in the picture on the right and here on the far left. Then this purple plant is Iringo leavenworthii. And then the one on the left is the hooker's oringo. It is the nectar plant. You see all kinds of insects on it. And then we have this little visitor who feels very safe, protected by the fence around him in the oringo. Next, we have the prairie gay feather. It's also called Kansas blazing star these tall spikes. It's a liatris or liatris, however you want to pronounce it. And I find that this particular species, Pycnostasia, is very difficult to germinate. If anybody has had some success with that, I would appreciate some hints. This particular wildflower, the Wildflower Center has 10 different common names for this one species. It really is beautiful, very striking plant. Then we go from tall to short, Texas frog fruit is a ground cover. And it is the host plant for the Phaon crescent butterfly. I have that in my yard. Here it showed growing a little bit taller, but it will withstand a lot of abuse. It grows all around our field office where it gets mowed regularly. As long as you leave it about an inch or two, it'll keep growing and blooming. It will die back in a freeze. You can't talk about prairie plants without talking about milkweed. So here we have a couple of species. All the milkweeds are Asclepias. There are over 100 species, three of which are found on our Katy Prairie sites. If you want to propagate, you want to cover this seed head with a little net and come back when the seed head is dried out and collect the pod before they all blow away. And of course, the milkweeds are host plants for monarch butterflies. So this is the species that's most common and naturally occurring at our Indian grass preserve. It's Cyzodes milkweed, which is Asclepius onotheroides. Here it is with the caterpillar. I think that was in my garden. And then here is the green milkweed. In the resources, page that I have for you, there is a link to the Nipsot Milkweed Guide if you want to learn more about milkweeds. It's a great guide. Maximilian Sunflower grows very tall. It's really beautiful and it will form colonies. And here's a related what we call narrow leaf or swamp sunflower. And I had this one growing in my garden at my previous house. And here it is with the bee. Pink ladies, unlike the other Texas wildflowers, this one's a perennial. And it's important to learn 
especially the perennials, what they look like when they're not blooming. I was able to find this photograph of the seedling and you can see the red on the back side of the leaves. And sometimes that comes through, you can see these spots from the top of the leaves as well. And that's one of the ways that I identify it in the wild. The flower just lasts one day, it is so pretty. And here's another picture of it growing right along the concrete trail at the Ann Hamilton Trail at Ingrass. Here is our goldenrod in the fall. I know this picture is very uh, pixelated, but it's supposed to look like an impressionist painting because I was taking a painting class that day uh, there at Indian Grass with Nancy Paris Pruden, and she's a great supporter and a fabulous artist. The resource page has a link to her website if you want to see some of her paintings. This goldenrod, the gallfly will burrow into the stem and lay its eggs in here and it will form this gall. And then the larva, when it emerges, will drill a hole to get out. So the spent plants we leave through the winter until the little holes appear and we know that the larva have emerged. The spider lily, I had to include this because it's just one of my favorites. In fact, my sampler is just mostly made up of things that I like no other specific criteria, but uh, I see that this is the logo for Clear Lake Nipsot. And then we do have American Lotus growing at our A Bear Reservoir, which is across the street from Indian Grass. Green Star Nursery came out and collected some seed pods. So I'm sure if you're looking to grow this, that you'll be able to find it there. Now we come to the test. We're getting to the end here and I have a little test for you. Can you name five species of flowering plants in this photo? So I am gonna give you a minute to think about that and take a good look at this photograph and see what you can come up with. I'll give you a hint. One of the five that I've identified is not really a bloom, it's just seeds. Okay, are we ready? Here we have the seeds of Coreopsis. Here and here we have American basket flower. Here we have Mexican hat. Over here we have bee balm, Monarda citriodora. And down here and back here, we have Gallardia pucella. Did everybody get that? Did anybody see something I missed? Very quickly, I wanna say how you can join in our effort. I know a lot of you don't uh, live out near the Katy Prairie, but uh, we do have seed collecting trips that go to a lot of our remnant prairies, such as Nash Prairie, Deer Park Prairie, and others. So if you want to join LAN, sign up on our website. Just go to the volunteer page on our website and you can sign up. And it's really great fun and you learn so much. Or you can do the Great Grow Out where we provide seeds and you grow plants at home. One of our volunteers ran out of four inch pots and used, it's just great. These little Whataburger cut off, Whataburger cups fit into an 18 cell tray. So. They were great at retaining water and uh, the plants did really well there. So I recommend it. You can come join us at Indian Grass Preserve if you're in the neighborhood. You don't have to have any previous experience. And again, you can sign up as a volunteer and come on one of our work days. Now in November, on November 12th, we have this year, we have our big event, which is sort of like a festival. It's called Putting Down Roots and we plant all the plants that we've grown in our nursery there at Indian Grass. 
it's a great activity for families. People learn a lot. We'll have a lot of different booths to learn other things about the prairie. So I invite you to come and join us that day because I don't wanna to have to plant all these plants myself. I've already got it, like, I, I don't know how many. The nursery's full. I'm gonna have more than enough plants for putting down roots. There are other volunteer opportunities. Check out our website. By joining in, you can help us reach our vision for the future. I really appreciate your giving me this opportunity to speak with you. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Great info, Iris. Thank you so much. We actually do have quite a few questions. Okay. Is the silver blue stem native to this area? Yes. Silver blue stem is one that's native for us. I have a grass pocket prairie in a city easement. The city will be repairing an under the street busted water pipe near it. The grasses have been there for three years. Should I try and dig them up or will they survive disturbance because of their deep roots? That just depends on how much disturbance there's going to be and how close that work is. I think that certainly you could dig them up and move them or save them for later. We have done quite a few what we call rescues, you know, where we go into a site that's going to be developed and dig up plants and bring them to our site. I did want that uh, near my previous home. That was the Psalms Road Prairie and the swamp sunflower that you saw in those pictures was from that site. And I also had big blue stem that I got from that site. So yes, I think that digging them up would be fine. Whether or not they would survive the disturbance, I'm not sure. Where can we get seed for the red blanket flower? You know, I haven't checked Native American seed for that particular species, but of course the best thing, you know, what I like best is just collecting the seed myself, then propagating it. So come on a seed collecting trip. <laughs> Maybe you'll find some. It's a pretty prolific seed producer, just like the other Gallardia. But do check Native American seed with that species name. My basket flower got six foot tall, Blackland Prairie in Georgetown. It has gone to seed and the lesser goldfinches are eating the seeds. And we Yay! love it. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. How would you recommend starting a pocket prairie? Can you do it from all seeds or would you also need starts? Yeah. Of course, the first thing is to understand the site and how you want to design it. But I would definitely uh, want to plant some pretty good size, like, you know, gallon pots of perennials and then put down seed in the fall for your annuals. But the perennials I definitely would do from potted plants. What is the fourth tall grass besides the coastal gamma grass? I have big blue stem, little blue stem, and switchgrass. The four tall grass prairie plants are big blue stem, little blue stem, switchgrass, and Indian grass. And then eastern gamma grass is the fifth one. Is the Conservancy working with any governmental agencies, for example, Harris County or TxDOT, to improve right-of-way management to promote natives and less mowing? Seems like a win-win. How to start? We do have some relationship with Harris County Flood Control. As far as I know, we don't have anything going on with TxDOT. We have had some conversations, I think, about like pipeline easements and having natives on pipeline easements. Tech stock really, you know, they do some things right. I once talked to a guy who worked for Tech Stock, and he was the one that told me, and this before I really got involved with plants at all, 
he told me that they would wait until the flowers, the wildflowers have gone to seed before they mow. I noticed your map did not include Galveston County. Correct. Because Galveston Bay Foundation and others are doing quite a bit of work there. So we really don't want to be in competition with others who are doing such a great job. Yeah, thank you a lot, Iris. That was really great. I appreciate you letting us know what's going on in that beautiful, beautiful area of the state. Appreciate everybody's efforts there. Well, I hope to see you out there. Thank you. Thank you everybody for attending and Iris for a wonderful presentation.